Cyclocross friends, and thanks for tuning in to episode 331 of Cyclocross Radio. On this episode, we are recapping everything that happened at Trek CX Cup in the final round of the Trek US CX series. Apologies for getting this one out late just from travel and life and uh, still figuring out how to edit these for YouTube. Uh, it took more time than I, than I wanted. So uh, Friday's not really when I want to get these out. We're going we're gonna to do better going forward. Uh, till we, uh, before we get into this episode, which um, I, th- I think you'll enjoy, we, all of the interviews that we did from uh, Trek CX Cup are, are here. If you want to see the video of those, head over to the YouTube channel. They'll be up um, there along with the, the rest of the podcast. Uh, this episode, like all of our episodes at the Wide Angle Podium Podcast Network, is brought to you by Hammerhead and the Carew. It's 50 degrees in DC right now. It's my favorite time of year to get out for a ride. So that's what I've been doing, getting up early, hitting it, have my Carew to plug my workout in there. Also my maps, know where I'm going. It's got, it's got all the stuff you need. It's uh, best, best bike computer out there. I'm just going to cut to the chase. What you get from listening to me talk about it right now is the opportunity to get a heart rate monitor on us at the wide angle podium. So if you go to hammerhead.io, you put the Carew into your shopping cart and then you add the uh, heart rate monitor and also add that to your shopping cart. When you check out, if you use the code CX radio, C X R A D I O, all caps, all one word, C X R A D I O, then you'll get the heart rate monitor on us. So hammerhead.io, put the Carew into your basket, put the heart rate monitor into your basket, enter the code CX radio, C X R A D I O. You're getting the heart rate monitor for us. I, I talk about this every week. Now it's the time to do it. We, we don't know when this is going to end. It might be tomorrow. So get in there, hammerhead.io, heart rate monitor and the crew. CX radio is your code C X R A D I O. Last thing before we get started, cyclocross season is is like halfway done here in the in the U.S., but it continues on past this. We got uh, lots of uh, U.S. athletes going to World Cups. We got lots of athletes whose goal for the season is to make it onto the World Championship team. To be able to do that, they need help, and where they get that help is through the Mud Fund. The Mud Fund is something that you and I and everybody else that loves cyclocross is able to fund and that funding goes directly to the athletes. It's it's a little different than in the past. In the past, there used to be USA Cycling trips. You would be selected to go on a trip with USA Cycling, go to Europe, and you know you would pay for that, and the Mud Fund would pay for that, and it was all all together. This year, it's 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 up to us to make those trips happen. So CXD is is going to have a trip. Comp Edge is going to have a trip. Um, Boulder Juniors, they're going to have a trip. And how these athletes are able to make this happen is that they apply for grants so they're going to say hey these are the these are the the races the world cups that i want to race and they're going to apply to the mud fund and the mud fund is going to look at these applications and distribute the funds to the riders so that they can accomplish their goals in europe So it's a little more of a direct route. So you're not, you know, in the past people were like, well, I don't want to give my money directly to USA Cycling. I don't know where it's going. That's not necessarily what happened in the Mud Fund in the past, but here you know that it's going directly to those athletes. So here's the copy I was supposed to read. That's just me. I am a huge supporter of the Mud Fund. I want you to be too. Let me give you the official words. Um, They can just discount everything I said before this. But the Mud Fund is the USA Cycling Fund that is the sole source of financial support for the U.S. Cyclocross program. Your donations are what help make it possible to send and support our athletes to Europe for racing opportunities such as the World Cups and World Championships. Many of the riders in the domestic U.S. UCI fields have benefited from this support in becoming the riders that they are. So what what I need you to do, the easiest way, well, 
two things. One, if you are on the audio version of this, even the YouTube, I will have the link to the Mud Fund in the show notes. So that's the easiest way. Other than that, just search you, um, Mud Fund Cyclocross. It should come up. Please think about donating. It's the, the budget out there. It's not a huge amount of money, you know, as these things go. You know, we're looking for like, I think it's like $125,000 overall. We can, we can easily meet that goal. Just uh, go to Mud Fund in the show notes or just search for it and please donate. All right. It's episode 331 of Cyclocross Radio. We got Bodie and myself in the media pit. We're talking about Trek CX Cup and the finale of the Trek USCX series. Now we're doing that right now. We are back in the media pit after a, a long weekend in Wisconsin to uh, finish up the Trek C no the Trek USCX series at the Trek CX Cup man that was confusing all weekend long. Bodie, I made it home. What hap- What what happened in airports this time? Painless man, just just smooth sailing out of Madison on Monday. I uh, got home and then I went and had an insane day at work the next day. So I thought running around the 28,000 steps I did on Trek at Trek Cup was bad. Uh, the, the Tuesday back into the grind was even worse. Wow. All right. Well, that's good. You're keeping it up. I mean, by the time you're done with the season, you should be like uh, entering a 10K or something. You're just going to crush it. Well... Funny you say that. This weekend, my girlfriend is doing a half marathon. Um, so I'm going to go up there. I'm not going to enter it, though. But I am, Bill, you'll be glad to hear this or excited for me as well. I'm going to bring my new camera, and I'm going to take some photos of runners to test out the new uh, Canon R5 that I got. Nice. Have you actually Have you actually pushed the shutter button yet? Not yet. It's still, still on the not shelf. Yet. No, I charged the battery. The battery is charged. It's over there. It's next to the box with the camera in it. So I think Friday night, you know, I'll put it together and such patience. I mean, yeah, I know, I know, really. I'm that's how busy I've been. And also like every the iPhone, such a good camera. Why did I even buy the R5, right? I mean, like folks, viewers, right? The iPhone works really good. Well, I mean, cuz that's the heckle that you get a lot when you're running around with all your gear. Somebody standing there on the side is like, "Oh, my phone's just as good as all your gear." And my response to most of those people is, is you're absolutely right. Yes, it is. I mean, it can do my, I have like a few different options, but when it all comes down to it, yeah, that's a, that's a great camera you got there in your hand. I'm, I'm with you. I mean, they, they don't like that answer. No, no. Yeah. I mean, look, it's for what we've done. I think sort of the not nothing tour, I think it, the iPhone, it worked. It worked well. It put it out. It was it was quick. It was fast. I went back and looked at some race footage I shot a couple of years ago and at nationals last year. And that, I mean, that stuff just looks really pretty, right? I mean, there's another. I mean, like there is something about a lens with bokeh and just like oh, yeah. smooth glass yeah. and log footage. So it can look better. But anyway, yeah, that's an intro. Hello. <laughs> so we did it. We uh, were able to get coverage out there i think it went over well you got a lot of compliments on getting people the the pretty much the story of the race with with a lot of the a lot of the moves a lot of the looks so yeah it was it was definitely not nothing and i think that we uh successfully filled a void um to to bring some pictures some moving pictures i'll say and i think it's important to say this when you feel this way but i'm i'm proud of the work that we did covering the uscx i think that it was good to have all four weekends together and you know i saw ben frederick said something about like kind of like end of school vibes and there was that kind of like we were all there's camaraderie around doing this thing for a month which is kind of amazing that it's like it has been a month um and then like we were able to put out a story and people could follow along and a lot of just funny to me is like a lot of uh instagram accounts that followed wide angle podium like no profile, zero posts, but like the last name is like the same as a bike racer. So I'm like, oh, this is like a family member who like signed up, created an account just so they could watch their kid or grandson or, or niece or nephew, whatever race. And I thought that was cool that that 
hey, that was a service that was provided and we did it and they got to see this story unfold. So Yeah, and I think that, you know, you, you, absolutely. And then the other point that you made there, just having the four consecutive weeks, I think just for the USCX as a whole, that was a huge improvement over last year when it seemed like all the excitement was in this first three weeks and then really the fourth week, I think less so because it was a month later and it just, you know, any, any momentum, any storylines, any narratives that you had built up over those first three weeks kind of just disappeared in that, in the end of it. Uh, so this way, you know, we were, we were able to see, uh, Clausel just like dominate for four weekends, go just run the table, eight straight wins, just amazing. And it was great to be able to do that in such a condensed period. You know, we were able to see it's kind of the like early dominance of Andrew Strohmeyer and then just kind of a collapse for two races and then come back and just, you know, put put the uh, the exclamation point on it at the end and, and take the, the final victory in the overall series. So, you know, those are the kind of stories that we always want. You know, that's like for seasons, we're like, well, you gotta, there has to be a narrative here. And we would talk about like, you know, there not being a series and, and, you know, nothing was like the USGP and that was for years. And then, you know, uh, the pro CX tried to, you know, USA cycling want to do the pro CX. And I'm like, well, it's 17 weekends long and it's like not all the same people. And it's just, you know, it's just, it doesn't have that connectivity that, that this did. So yeah, just, um, just a great, a great start to the season. Now, now comes the tricky part though, right? Like we had all of this excitement. We had a lot of hype for this. We had a lot of great storylines. We had everybody showing up because they wanted to be a part of the series. You know, there was money on the line. There's points on the line. It's something that people know. So it's easy to get the word out there on that season doesn't end though. Right. I mean, we still we still have more than half of the, the season left. So it's going to be a challenge now to kind of rebuild that momentum. Yeah, I mean, we're just about halfway through. We did five weekends or six weekends left, I think, and counting nationals. Right. So that's that's interesting talking about the narrative. Right. We had the one narrative, this sort of opening not really a prologue it's the it's the first act of the season and now we now you know we there is a little bit of downtime and major taylor unfortunately like you hear a lot of folks saying see you at kings and so like okay but you know what know what happens then new folks folks who are sort of like you know fighting to get into those top five top no top 10 positions are now sort of going to become the main characters of this race and they can kind of sort of get a little bit of their time they can you know, to bring it back to like Clausel talking about coming to the States, like you sort of can be at the front and be trying to like how to be racing tactically, not just being on your limb the entire time. So that sort of stories are, are allowed to evolve. And then, you know, yeah, we go into, you know, Kings and really rad. And then I think sort of this middle part of the season is, is kind of like, you know, Pan Ams. It's sort of the, the first, well, I mean, I guess there is a Jersey for us CX, but sort of like there's a series now we have the first Jersey fight around Pan Ams. And then we sort of have that, that second, the third part, which is, you know, the national title. And then, and then we have the sort of the fourth arc is, is Europe, but yeah, we're, we're halfway through Bill. And I think that, you know, I'll take a rest week, you know, I think you're going to take a rest week and then we'll, we'll bounce back excited again. Um, yeah. I have an idea here and I'm going to just put it out. Cause I think you were absolutely right that, that for people, who may have been at the top at these races, I don't believe a lot of them are going to Major Taylor, which is, you're absolutely right, that is then an opportunity for others to step up, for others to really race for the podium that may not had that chance in the previous four weeks. Uh, we're not going. It just, we needed, we, we, we are amongst those who needed, needed a rest week. So we're, we're not going to be there, but here's what I want to do, Bodie, since I think that in th these interviews that we were doing that complemented both of our coverage of this, you know, I, I use them a lot to write my race reports. And then, you know, you were able to pull it from, for highlights and that kind of stuff. And we're going to see them here. What I'd like to do. So I'm just putting it out there. If you're, if you're on a podium at major Taylor, we're gonna we're gonna be we're gonna be setting up a Zoom call. I want I would love to do that like 
Saturday night and Sunday night, like after the races, I want to talk to all six people on the podium so that we still have that material and we still can learn what happened at that race. All right. That's my goal. So if you're well, listening, get on a podium. Let's let's chat after after the race. Well, just quickly, I, since I have it uh, pulled up here, Major Taylor race predictor on Saturday. That's Carolyn Mani, great interview. Amelia Shea and Emily Shields. And then on the men's side, Ian Acker, Tyler Clark, and Tobin Ordenblad, who we'd love talking to. Never, never talked to Ian or Tyler as well. So that that or, could be cool to meet them. So anyway, no pressure on y'all riders who are just called out with the race triggers called you podium. But a uh, little bit as Tobin, Tobin Ordenblad has the uh, has the weight of a of of the United States on his shoulders on that race predictor. Oh, that's true. It's right. Yeah, a couple of Canadians in front of him, huh? Or yes, all around him, Evan Russell too behind him, Canadian oh, national champ. All right. Okay, well, let's not get too much into Major Taylor. <laughs> yeah, uh, let's uh, let's not talk about next week before we talk about last week. What? Last week? Wow. Okay. Uh, Bill. Yeah. Trek. Trek CX Cup. How many times have you been to Trek? Wow. Uh, I believe I was there maybe once before it was a World Cup. Maybe. So 2016? I think. But definitely, definitely all of the, ever you know, definitely all of the World Cup years I was there. Okay. Yeah, 2016 was the year that uh, the Lions did come over, and it was them versus Steve Chanel Steve. And it was it was live stream because I watched it, and I remember being like at a fantastic race. And I remember yeah. sort of seeing that venue for the first time. I think I was there because I think because Cross Vegas was that year, right? I think so, yeah. I, yeah. Um, I think I remember seeing you there. I feel like you, yeah. were, you were kind no, of No, I was definitely there because we were, that's I think when we were doing the, the itch tour, I think. Um. So then I went in 17. It was my first time. It was the World Cup. Van, Matthew Vanderpool. We had uh, Sonic Kant. Uh, fantastic experience. So I was 17, 18, 19, and I haven't gone since. I was supposed to go last year. Couldn't because of work thing. Back in 24. Um, it's good to be back. It was it was a different vibe than in the past, but also at the same time, it felt sort of familiar, and I... I'd love to see how the thing has evolved. We went to Factory Hill and I was like, oh, didn't this used to do this little switch back here? And then it would come around. And you're like, yeah, it's kind of trying new things. But there was like a rut that was still there that I thought was pretty cool. And just it was fun to walk around and see sort of, you know, how they adjust to a couple of things. Um, I think it's interesting. One, one thing I like about track, and I think it's kind of different. You know, I've sort of talked about how I liked Charm in Rochester, these in these public parks. Trek is, is, it's the behind their factory, right? And this, this piece of land that they own. And I think that's a cool, another cool aspect. And I think this is like a, a thing that bike brands, maybe some do this and I don't know, but like, this is like a good example of how, how a brand can sort of like give back to the sport and sort of bring people in is like, they're sort of like, we're going to hold this event, like at our house, like come to our house, like party with us. We're going to have a secret bar. We're going to give out cheese curds. We're going to make t-shirts that reference like an inside joke for a cool bulletin subscribers. Uh, I, just this whole, the whole thing. I like, I like how they have embraced this. They have the legends race. You see, you see, oh my God, I'm blanking. Santa Claus is out there. You got cows and giraffes and yeah, lots yeah. of good it, stuff there. That's some uh, chainsaw art going on in the secret bar on one day. It, yeah. But even... And then on top of that, and I, I think that even though it wasn't a World Cup, even though the crowd might have been down from those World Cup years, it was still uh, a great vibe. It was still a lot of people out there racing, uh, tons of people racing, right, and hanging out and just uh, having a good time. And it, it was cool. And then when you get to the, the the track, I think I do think that the features on this track come closest to World Cup or European level features i i think that the the run-up is legit the the off camber is a legit feature in that whole wooded part you know it's that off camber into the into a pretty steep uphill um the the factory hill is a tactical legit feature so i think that's that really sets this apart a bit in that there are 
challenging parts to this course. Yeah, I agree. I think I think that's you know, it's a shame. I was thinking about this. Uh the the coverage of that race, this is a harder race for me to cover. Uh if you look on the if you notice the Instagram stories, I sort of have kind of hitting like three or four spots. And and that is the nature of this venue is that you it was it was kind of a tape farm on one side. We're just kind of a lot of twisties on itself. Um, some good turns, but just it was so hard to get there and make my way back that I did focus on the off camber, the run up factory hill, and then that's that section from pit one to the flyover because as we as we heard is a very tactical spot. And so that was my one thing that I was like kind of bummed about Trek was like, ah, I just can't get like it's not like charm where I could literally get all of it. And that's just like a me issue. Like I feel like the coverage was fine, but I'm like like I always like build, where's the move going to be? I need to be in that spot. It's like, I can't, I'm one person. I can't be at every spot, but like, yeah, that's, that's the, I think those features are good. And I, I want, I wanted to be able to show the off camber into that sort of U-turn uphill back down. Cause it's kind of like, I don't want to say mountain bike, but it's, yeah, you're right. It feels very like Euro style, like, kind of like narrow through some trees we're going up we're going down um yeah I, and i was bummed that i wasn't able to share that with with the viewers yeah and it's i don't think it would have come across anyway it didn't on the broadcast but if you see it it's another one of these sections that it's filled with decent climbs like good grade climbs and what always just amazes me watching riders come through there at the top of the sport is how you know how it flattens out on TV? They 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 do that in real life. They are just able to just flatten out these hills. They're just going so hard on them. And that's, I think, the the other difficult part about this track is that, yes, it has these features, but also it really is an all-out track. You know, there's there's not a ton of place to really catch your breath and recover. It's just just hard the whole time. And we, you know, that that came into play in, in, in the races we're going to talk about. Should we talk about the uh day one let's talk about the women from day one yeah i mean i think sort of you know talking about women day one talking about women day two they're kind of like there is one storyline this whole season that's been elaine clazelle and sort of like how dominant she's been right and that that played out uh both days at trek and i think the other storyline which you you know talking about earlier was the sort of narrative uh for Monin was the steady improvement, right? Just kind of like coming into the season, didn't come here to get fourth. You know, that was what she got to go across. And then just kind of evolving attempts, getting better, understanding American racing, sort of, you know, just really kind of building the community around her of other riders and just like, you know, that communal aspect um, was getting better. And, you know, it kind of seemed like she was starting to race. It was like, her, it was her and Elaine who were like going to be at the front and were going to be, the win was going to come from them. And then it was sort of what was, it was like the rest of the riders who was going to battle for that last podium spot. And we saw sort of, you know, various riders kind of shuffle through. And I think this weekend, you know, Sydney McGill um, on day one, you know, kind of come, came back after sort of maybe a little rougher weekend in charm. Um, but yeah, there was some, there was some good battles, but once again, it was mostly Manin and Helene. And then, you know, what was going to happen for the last podium spot. Um, yeah, and the, I think the other storyline worth mentioning, because most of the riders were talking about it, was that both days were really windy. That that was the other factor here. Like, it was already hard, and then, you know, there were certain points that you were racing into a headwind, and that really played into day one. I think that the narrative that we were looking at, you know, especially after talking to Bacher, which you're here, here is that uh, th- this was a course that she felt like she had an advantage because she could ride the planks. The planks at Trek are Euro height planks. You know, there are you, people who are running everywhere else on the uh, US CX uh, tour were riding these planks because they're just a just a little bit lower. Uh, so, and, so, so, say on Euro height is lower. Yes. I didn't, I didn't realize that. I was assuming the it's was a, I mean, it's, you harder. can, the, the, the limit is 40 centimeters. It's kind of like the speed limit. You know, the speed limit is 70. It doesn't mean you have to drive 70. It's just, you can't drive over 70, right? 
But everybody's like, well, you got to go 70 because Philo is 70s. So I'm going to go 70. And so in America, we're like, well, the barriers have to be, the barriers can't be over 40 centimeters. So we'll put them at 40 centimeters, 40 centimeters, 40 centimeters. And then they're really tall. And in Europe, they're like, well, they can't go over 40 centimeters. Nobody said they can't go under 40 centimeters. So, so they, they lop off a good like 10 centimeters off those. And they're lower, and and it means that most people are just like hopping them, uh, and that's, I think, under the direction of I'm going to guess the Lions when they came over for these World Cups, since they're they were sponsored by Trek, uh, they were like, eh, we might want to just like lower these. We don't okay. we don't need your old school, you know, Wisconsin cyclocross uh, planks here. Let's get let's get something that's a little more uh, in line with uh, most of the people that are going to be racing this World Cup. So they still have those, and Bakker's able to ride them. And the problem is that on day one, when you were coming up to the barriers and then off to a long stretch before Factory Hill, all of that was into a headwind. So it sort of took away that advantage. She didn't want to ride, get ahead, and then have to be in the headwind and do all the work and just have Clausel catch up and then sit on her and attack her at Factory Hill. So that that was kind of like she was hoping tailwind, then she can get away and then maybe do something there. But that wasn't the case. So uh, really any advantage that Bakker thought she had on that day was kind of taken away by the wind. Um, should we let uh, – I just described it. Should we let her describe it? Should we uh, listen to yeah. Man and Yeah, let's do that. She said the same thing. that you, she, she thought the same thing. You were really at the same level when you're out there riding. Um, you know, I, I asked her this and she wasn't really sure, but it looked just watching it from the side that you did have that advantage riding the planks versus her running them. Was that, did you feel like that was true or not enough? No, that was true. Definitely true. I've, most of the times I just let her go in front after the barriers because there was the hot wind after it. And I was like, you can go first. I'll, I'll just go in your room. So, yeah, it was definitely a lot faster to jump the barriers. I think you could win probably five seconds if you're a really good jumper. So, yeah, it's a big difference. But then she knew she had to be in front. And, yeah, that's the mistake I made. I had to be in front. And that's that's kind of it, like on the last lap, right? You went, that's, that, is that the point that you need to be ahead? Yeah, I need to, yeah. It's then, it was different because I was thinking about it before the race. But after the barriers, you had the hot wind part. And I was like, I think it's maybe too far if I'm in front after the barriers. And you have a hot wind, she probably will come over me just in front of the corner after that. And that's why I was so surprised she to be, uh, attacked just after the second pit. But that was good of her because, yeah, surprise is the text of the best. <laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah. Any other questions? Anything for tomorrow? Try anything different? What's What's... Last yes, race but it's better to keep it for tomorrow. All right, so, <laughs> so we'll talk about that afterwards then. Yeah. It's okay, good. It's awesome. Good. Thank you. Yeah. So, yeah, Manin, Manin saying, you know, surprised that Elaine attacked pretty early, um, which kind of neutralized uh, maybe her plan, um, which, you know, I'm happy to say it's in the coverage, folks. You can go back and watch the story. You see the attack. I'm very far away, but you can see it. Um it was interesting. I was watching the footage right before we started this race, and and then there was a section right before they go into Factory Hill. Elaine has a gap. She's she's coming towards the camera, and you see Manon chasing, and she's looking down. And in the moment, I thought that was the look down of like, I'm done, like I've given up. But I I realize now that that was her looking down to make sure she's in the right gear for Factory Hill. Elaine comes out of Factory Hill, is just punches it. Manon is kind of like. Has, has has given up, has, has realized the race is over. Um, and she talks about that sprint being set up for Elaine. It's a short, sh much shorter sprint. Uh, Elaine's very much more punchier. So I kind of think that if they were together, that again was sort of play into Elaine's hands. Yeah. So, you know, attack at pit two wasn't really something we were expecting to see, but uh, Clausel made that work. And then we had a pretty good battle going on for third place on day one. Yeah. Um, so we had, we had, we had, uh, Klaus, we had McGill and we had Monty who sort of started back and sort of rode her way up to the, to that duo. And then it became a trio. And at some point it was McGill and, uh, and Monty. 
And there's this great uh, point where McGill makes the pass into the off camber, which we'll talk about in day two, because there's only one line and at the end of that lap. You know, McGill is, is, is solo, but at the barriers, we, unlike Elaine and Manon, McGill's yeah. hopping the barriers and, you know, Late in the lap, we do see that Monty gets back to her, but that, you know, that extra effort to catch back up to McGill might have been the final, you know, straw that break that camel's back. Yeah. Uh, so we hear from McGill. Let's do it. You got Manon and Aileen out there just kind of doing their thing again. What's your plan to integrate into that into that duo today? Um. Yeah. I tried to go with them the first couple laps, kind of got hung up with a few, like burning a few extra matches just to get around other riders and a little bit of yo-yoing. Um, so then I fell back a little bit and I did eventually catch back on at, I think, start of the third lap, um, but burnt a few too many matches doing that. And then they attacked somewhere in the back and couldn't go with them. Uh, so yeah, hopefully for tomorrow I can try and save it a bit more. Is it a question of the terrain or we heard a lot of talk about the wind out there? Was that, especially if you're riding alone, is that where you're burning these matches? I think burning the, burnt a lot of mass matches trying to like make passes or like closing gaps that other people were kind of falling back from. Um, but, uh, yeah, wind, once I was on my own, definitely didn't feel too great but there was the heat for me was the biggest <laughs> problem yeah and we, we saw like magley drop that was that like one of the wheels that you were for, following for a while and did you sort of get lulled into her sort of slowing down some yeah i was on her wheel for a while and i think the euros they kind of pulled away from her and then i couldn't quite get around her um and when i did then there was a gap to really try and chase back but yeah us Canadians in this heat, man. We're ready for winter. <laughs> so, so uh, possibly same conditions tomorrow. Any anything you do to change? Um, try and stick to their wheels instead of having a rider or two in between us. I want to try and get right on those wheels. So, whole shot. Maybe, maybe if it's less windy. <laughs> All right. Uh, yeah. So, uh, McGill, good race on there. You know, we, we will talk more about Rochette, but she did end up dropping out of that race, which, you know, was kind of, kind of a bummer, especially after we talked to her last week and she was talking about how excited she was. Cause you know, she didn't feel like she was in good enough form or just wasn't feeling like going back to gravel and then going back to cyclocross was the right thing for her to do at this point. So she was feeling better about cyclocross and, and, uh, stuck with that and then just you know really didn't have didn't have a very good race on the this first day so um yeah but we we will we will follow up on on that one here in a couple minutes but anything anything else worth mentioning for day one for the women let's uh let's just stick with the women and move to day two the one change from day one to day two is that uh the wind kind of shifted direction. So where there were tailwinds the day before, now there were headwinds. At least that's what we came in thinking was going to be the storyline. And I was like, oh, this is a big deal because we heard so much about where the headwinds were on Saturday and now they've moved to Sunday. Maybe that would play out. Maybe that wouldn't. Turned out, Bodie, it 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 didn't really matter. Yeah. I mean, kind of the it for the front, I feel like it was it was sort of the same, same thing. Um, it, it seemed that Monin just had less legs. Um, I know that she had like a, a flat maybe early on, um, and sort of kind of burn matches, maybe trying to go to the pit, not go to the pit, stay away from, um, Sydney McGill in the battle for second. Um, so yeah, but yeah, you know, bigger story obviously is Rochette, uh, Katie Klaus fighting for third, uh, really good fight there. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think it's, you know, and I think we can jump to that now. I think the the the, the top really, Clausel just kind of ran away with this one. And, and it was it was what we had seen every week before Bacher. Uh, I think over the over the progression of the of the series was able to establish herself in that second place. I think that's what you you were you know, you alluded to it before. I think that's what was really frustrating her. Yeah, she wanted to win these races, but she knew that Clausel was kind of coming in with a little better form but then she was frustrated that she wasn't 
getting second out there. She figured she'd at least get second place. So she started, you know, rolling in these these seconds as as the as the the series progressed and ended up the weekend with two second places. And more importantly, I think that that we'll we'll talk about with this race. You know, the the series also there were implications for the series from her finishing second on the eighth day because until that time Sydney McGill was actually in second place. So th- this is where, you know, we talk about the series being cool that the riders not only were worried about winning the race but they also had the eye their eyes on other racers out there and to make sure that they were staying ahead of them, you know, the two the two biggest examples of that that we were looking at were McGill and Bacher and then also um, we'll get to it later, but uh, Funston and Kerry Warner. Yeah, and, and also talk about like how the tactics played in for Strohmeyer, right? Kerry's like, well, Strohmeyer's in the lead. He doesn't chase me. Like he knew that he'd get ahead. So yeah, having that, that overall series did play into, did factor into how these races played out. Yeah. And let, let's actually, um, let's listen to uh, Manabacher again, just uh, on day two. And she kind of talks about that in here. Once that, you know, once once Elaine sort of got that lead on you, did the series overall come into your head at all? Because you you and Sydney yeah. were like really close, and you were a couple points behind. So, actually, that was the only goal I had today. But my goal was to be in front of Sydney. It didn't matter if it was two or four, be in front. So that's why I didn't want to pay at the beginning because then she was pretty close at the beginning, and then she come back on my wheel, and I didn't want that. So that's why I kept. Riding, even though I knew it wasn't the best strategy because, yeah, my tire pressure was way too low in the corners. But, yeah, two in final is good. So, fi- final final critique of the series on a whole and the trip? I should have more confidence in the Rochester Cross. I got fourth and third, but should have had more confidence. Probably would have got second. But that's okay. Ready to go home? Yes, I know. I don't want it to. It's been so much fun. The month was too short, but on the other hand, it's nice to have your own space. All right. Well, we had, we talked a couple of years, uh, weeks ago, years, ah, weeks ago, and you were not sure about next year. So just just put it out there. Hope hope to have you back here for this again next year. <laughs> I hope so. I have to talk to my team and uh, smile. Like, please let me go. I really enjoyed that last part. Just hearing how Manon just really enjoyed being in the States. Um, and you could see that, like you could see that chatting with the writers and you took a great photo Sunday night, Bill, uh, with Monin and her brother, Aryan, and then Strohmeyer and Catherine. And I mean, it's, it's a visually striking image because you have one of the shorter writers and then the, the tallest person at the venue together. Um, but it just kind of feels like, you know, she came here and, and, Maybe was just with the family unit in the minivan. Sick minivan, by the way. I think it's a Chrysler. Um, but then at the end, you know, she was hanging in with the CXD fan, uh, group and and other riders talking about, you know, coming to Europe and let's, you know, let's get together. And so, like, like I think we've said this multiple times on this podcast. It was awesome. Like, we love it. It's really cool. And I hope that she comes back. And I mean... Let's get Lawrence to come back too. Yeah, that might be a more difficult one. Yeah, probably. All right, we we kind of jumped around here. We were talking about Rochette a little bit. Uh, she was able to, you know, have a better day on Sunday. Was mixing it up in the in the in the group, and uh, you know, came away with a, with that third place and I, I think it was you know we talked to her afterwards and it was kind of interesting just getting her reluctance to talk about saturday but finally just sort of coming out and explaining what was going on in her head and uh neither of us are trained professionals but sometimes i feel like when we do these interviews are kind of like these mini counseling sessions not with us giving any counseling but just right. giving like more the the riders uh a, a an opportunity to kind of um mm-hmm in the moment debrief themselves on what's going on. And that's why I'm oh, yeah. always, you know, after the race, I'm like, let's, let's, let's go get them now. And it's kind of funny. Cause I, I think we learn, we're like, okay, let's get this person right now. 
but then let's actually wait and get this person mm-hmm. at the podium and give them a chance to kind of reflect on what what happened. Mm-hmm. It was almost this this game we were trying to play to get the best best moments from from people. But uh, yeah, I thought I thought that that conversation we've had with uh, Mags was really um, a really good one. Let's uh, let's listen to that. Let's start with yesterday mm-hmm. and what was going on with you in yesterday's race and even from that without knowing anything we were like oh is she even going to be racing today yeah uh yeah i mean i'm like wondering in my mind how how open i want to be about it but yeah i'll be open about it i've just been struggling uh physically but also mentally like i think the fact that i was struggling physically has affected me mentally as well and so i feel like i'm kind of going through some changes right now uh personal i mean nothing strange just like trying to work on my mindset and trying to work on things like that and i think yesterday i was pretty nervous and so i'm i made like such an amateur mistake and i thought like i'm gonna try to approach the race differently and try to because sometimes i take it too seriously and 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 that affects me negatively and so I tried to be relaxed about it and to do that, I kind of changed my pre-race routine and I ate something completely different and I did everything a little bit differently. And I felt like such a piece of shit. I wanted to puke the whole time and I felt really, really bad. And I think, yeah, I just like, it started spiraling and then whatever. I decided to pull out because at some point I wasn't racing anymore. Um, on the moment, it felt like the right decision because I thought like, okay, like this did not work clearly. So like, I'm going to try to do better tomorrow. Looking back, like maybe it was disrespectful to my competitors to, to pull out, um, you know, because like actually maybe I wasn't racing with the same like well, not me, but like the other people I was racing with and like when you're training, you're on the spot, you want to have wheels to follow and people to challenge you. And I had that. So like, I felt not so great about it. Um, but that was my call, so you live with it. And today I said, you know what, new day, like I'm going back to my normal routine, I'm still trying to stay relaxed, but like stick with the basic, uh, which I mean, I know is so amateur, but like sometimes you try things and you get lost. So today felt better and I was really just focused on executing the things well. And that kept me super engaged the whole time and I had such a blast. So it was actually super fun and that gives me momentum. So I'm happy about that. Well, that's awesome. And I, I think first off, you shouldn't, beat yourself up because you're making that decision in the in the heat of the moment and mm-hmm. then you know you can look and reflect on it later fine but you came back today and you you fought strong and hopefully found that routine again and uh had it had a good b- battle there for the podium and you know just talking to mm-hmm. katie it sounded like she was going really strong especially into that last yes. lap and we're like right on the top of factory hill and it seems like that's where it, yeah that's where maybe maybe she was a little too strange she was yeah i mean it was actually super fun to battle with her and like we wanted to attack at the same place but she went just a bit before me so i'm like okay you know what i'll let her go i'll try to rest on her wheel and i noticed that every lap on the factory hill i was climbing a little bit better than her so even if i was behind i could get to the top kind of at the same time so I decided to let her have a little bit of a gap so I could like kind of let go of the brakes, pedal at the bottom and try to catch her on the top. But then she crashed. Thank God I had that little gap because then I could run and get around her. And that's how I got her. But it was, yeah, it was an actually super fun battle. Um, Yeah, just, you know, that's why you love cross and I really loved it. And thank you for saying that about yesterday. Like I did try to have compassion for myself afterwards, you know? Because that's more positive than beating myself up. So, yeah, compassion for like yeah, going through a bit of a rougher time. But I think uh, I think I'll get I'll get back to where I want to be. So yeah, it's you, good. You, you ended the ended the weekend on a on a high note, back on the back on the podium, and just uh, up from here. Yeah, exactly. You gotta get that momentum wheel turning, and today was today today did that. So I'm I'm stoked on that, and just yeah, happy, excited for more cyclocross. Always a pleasure to interview Mags. A lot of insight opens herself up you know she put this all in her newsletter as well so i feel like we feel fine sharing this here and she spoke to us um but it's you know it's it's just it's insightful to hear these things but what what writers are going through and i think as fans it sort of endears you to them and it sort of creates it builds 
you know, these are people, but it builds their character. And so it sort of, it, it, it gives another thing for a person to get behind an athlete when they kind of share their true selves. And so we always appreciate uh, Magalie that she does that. Um, but yeah, she had, she had a good battle with, with Katie and, you know, someone on Substack was like, you guys haven't talked to Katie yet. We, so we have been talking to Katie. We talked to Katie after every race. We love chatting with her. She's super nice and generous with her time as well. But like you said, Bill, we have been just in time wise, like just podium, like that's it. Like that's what we can like handle. But, you know, Katie really wanted to get on that podium. She was, she they like like Mag said, she had the same idea. She was gunning for it and just didn't happen. And, you know, she 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 wanted one because she I think she came in a little bit undercooked, hadn't raced, I think she said since May, but I think you saw her progression just kind of getting comfortable in doing cross races and just kind of getting back to herself, her her the way she knows how to race. So good to see that. you know. You know, wanted to say it too early, but she's my Nats pick, so we'll hopefully be hearing a lot more from Katie. Yeah, I, I think that's a that's a that's a good pick for that. And you're you're absolutely right. We were uh, chatting with her, and you're talking about like one of the people that um, once she is on camera talking to her, endearing herself to to fans. Yeah, all she wanted was that podium, and she yeah. really, I mean, she just uh, it was just so sad because she thought she had it wrapped up. She did everything absolutely right and just yeah went into that went into that last rut just just too hot and and crashed herself out. So yeah, huge bummer there for her. Anything else on these women results? I, I, I think the 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 story you know that uh, Bakker was talking about just uh, really racing for the the series uh is 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 worth pointing out Clausel ended up taking the series obviously you know didn't didn't lose a race there so that was an easy one uh on on the final day Bacher was able to move ahead of Sydney McGill by yeah, eight points by what eight points eight points yeah well I mean Sydney was a little farther down you know she uh what she finished she finished fifth so that's yeah. between second and fifth uh just Point wise, um, Katie Klaus uh, and yeah, fourth. Katie Klaus in fourth, uh, Manny in fifth, Zerner, Zerner in sixth. Kind of the same, you know, sort of played out uh, pretty similar to what we were seeing in these races for those those racers that showed up every week. You know, you look at uh, you look at Carolyn Manny. She had, and this is interesting how the series kind of works out. She had one bad race. Right. You know, she had, she had, well, not even a bad race. I, I take that complete. I'm looking at the points and you get like two points just for showing up. Like you get one point for registering, you get one point for starting. So she started, she had that ankle issue where she really couldn't even walk. So she, she pulled out of day two at charm and that put her down to, you know, she only got two points for that race. Yeah. Uh, she's, she gets her normal 30 points and she's uh, right up there looking looking at you know top three spots in there uh so yeah good good stuff on the on the series um my one suggestion that hopefully we will be uh implemented next year the uh points for the c2 day should be the same as the c1 day you know just because c1s and c2s are different at points wise for the uci it doesn't mean that the series has to be different points they should all be the same points i think i think the uh promoters may May agree with that point, so we may we may get a change there, which could uh, make things even more interesting next year. Yeah, sounds good. All right, moving on to the men race, men's races. Uh, day one. What happened on day one? Day, oh, what, what happened just, on day one? Well, day. I mean, a lot a lot of things happened on day one. That's why I said, oh, because I remember watching the footage, and the one thing I remember in the beginning was there was a big group. There was like eight guys sort of, you know, maybe not always together, but there was a big battle at the front for a while. And that was, that was, that was, we like to see it. Um, and I, you know, one of the stories was Benjamin Frederick, fourth place uh, on that day. And, you know, we, when I film, um, I try to catch a lot of, you know, if there's a big group, if there's a big group, I will, in the beginning, I will show a lot of that. And if that big group stays together, then they stay there at the front of the race. They stay in my coverage because as much as I'd love to tell, there's all kinds of battles back in the field, but 
for just kind of showing the podium. So some folks are not in the coverage as much as we'd like or they'd like and just kind of how it goes. Um, but because of that day, because there's so many writers, I was filming a lot more. That's that's kind of why it stuck in my head. Like Tyler Clark was there, um, Dylan Zakaichak, Z- um, uh, Caleb Schwartz, you know, all these writers who sort of maybe, you know, have been sort of top 10-ish were sort of up the front. And I thought that was really cool to see until until what happened, Bill? What 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 was the who was the main protagonist of that of day one who would you say well scott funston got off to a good start he was kind of leading that procession that you were talking about uh terry werner i think is the the person that is the uh the person of interest in this he actually had a slower start and had to kind of work his way back in there so nothing really happened on that first lap i think it was probably the second lap that he was able to go to the front they made it down the big off camber Kerry was in the lead uh he thought Strohmeyer was on his wheel Strohmeyer was actually I think a couple more riders back but he kind of heard he heard what he thought was a crash behind him he thought it was Strohmeyer and he was like this is the time to go uh so he did I mean being that seasoned bike racer that he is you know cyclocross you you hear something go bad behind you and then you know that's the time that you you just burn one of those matches and go go all in uh Kerry did that it was Strohmeyer actually did have an issue there he had to put a foot down he needed to get off his bike and run so that put him back and that sort of opened up this gap for for Kerry to just uh go off the front um coupled with uh having to dismount Strohmeyer also was losing pressure and his wheel had to go in and pit that gave Kerry even more of a gap and that that kind of set up um uh, a game of catch up for for Strohmeyer who you know has been our favorite for this uh entire time to kind of probably spend a lot more energy than he wanted just to real carry back in. Yeah, I mean I think well I think that what was interesting about that day one is it was seeing carry first of all it was seeing carry up the front and seeing Strohmeyer sort of on the back foot which we hadn't seen except for the previous race in Charm City, but we hadn't, there's no, there's no Strohmeyer on the back foot for like, it, it was like at the end of the race, right? When he sort of fell. Yeah, and, in, in Charm City, it just looked dominant. And then he just like fell apart in those last right. two laps here. You know, he talks about it. Like not only was Kerry keeping the pace really high, but we talked about that win where he had to work really hard in these headwinds with really nobody else up there with him to try to, get Kerry back yeah and Kerry was well aware of what was going on and was was happy to be out front and letting and then then it's like who is going to be the who's play a little breakaway chicken like who is going to put in the effort to pull him back because Strohmeyer is leading the series so why should he pull him back although someone might say you yeah you are the leader you have to pull him back so uh it was it was it was exciting to see Kerry off the front um and one of the fun parts about Kerry being on Mo- Carolina Monty's team is that he has a cheering squad and he also has his director sportif who is apparently offering a hundred dollar premiums if he wins the race that made it pretty fun yeah it's a little extra incentive there Kerry actually talks us through this uh this battle really well so um well I mean before we get to that I, I think it probably is worthwhile just kind of talking about how the rest of the race plays out so Strohmeyer was able to catch Werner uh and then they rode around for a while and then with two laps to go you know you talked about one of the one of the places that we were watching was from pit one to the flyover and that 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 kind of is where Strohmeyer was um he had that he had that section just sort of penned in all, all weekend long is that's the place to go so two laps to go he makes an attack off there gaps carry is able to get him and has a good like eight ten second uh lead over him and you know we're all sort of making our way to the finish line for the final lap thinking well this this is this is like every other race has been however it's not how every other race has been because we had the last race at charm city where things just fell apart in the end and they go uh through pit two go back into the woods uh, Strohmeyer's leading and then all of a sudden you know we hear Bill Elliston 
uh, saying that it's Kerry Warner alone at the at the planks coming through. We're just like, what the heck happened? Yeah, I mean, uh, so the thing about Trek is like, for that race, I could show them coming into Factory Hill, and then like they would go into Factory Hill, and then I I could run to the finish line and get because there was enough time, and so, um, and so yeah, right. So I'm I'm sitting there, I'm set up with my camera. Like here's gonna come Stromeyer, you know, procession, and it's Kerry Warner, and I'm like, what? And so like he goes by, I'm like, I jet to the finish, he he finishes, and then you know, everybody's like, the question's like, I got all the DMs then that that night, like what happened to Stromeyer? Yeah, let's uh let's hear Kerry tell 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 what went down. Okay, yeah, <laughs> Kerry Warner, should should we now call it a comeback? Sure, I mean, fuck, I've been here, man. <laughs> Just no. took a little while. Yeah, so I'm older now. I mean, to get the diesel going. Not even talking about. Well, okay, but that's the question. You you got the diesel going super quick today. First off the line, and just kind of took it to these kids. Yeah, well, I mean, like I knew it was gonna be windy, so I knew if like you got a gap, people are gonna be like fucking around back there, worrying about who's chasing it down. So I wanted to get to the front early and. Coming into that big off camber section, uh, I think Strohmeyer took a crash when he was on my wheel, so that's where I got my initial gap. And then I knew just like staying on it would require like the field just splintering behind me, and then we'd have a groove. So um, Strohmeyer or Funston almost came up to Strohmeyer and I had a couple times. So like in my head, you know, I knew Strohmeyer was playing that game. Like you know, like I'm winning the USCX, like. I don't need to be pulling right now. Like, so it put a little pressure on me to set the pace. And uh, fortunately that would happen every time on the, the start finish straight. So I'd sit on and then Funston would almost connect and then I'd punch it again. So like, I was confident that I could keep Funston away, but then I was worried about the matches being blown and Strohmeyer attacked with two to go. And then I'm not, I'm not sure exactly what happened, but halfway through the last lap, he just detonated in a really big way. Like the wheels just came off. And I mean, like I kept thinking to myself, like, like it can't be this easy, but yeah, I just had to keep it together there and like just ride it in clean. So when you, when you started that and you were getting that gap, did you feel like, okay, I can, this is a 60 minute pace or you're just like, I just need to do what I can. No, I knew like, I probably wasn't going to stay out there by myself, but I knew that like I was, I wasn't riding all, all out. I just wanted to ride hard enough that those guys would kind of look at each other and eventually somebody would have to attack and bridge up to me and then and then whoever that was and me could sort it out. So that was kind of my plan. What's it feel like uh, crossing that line first again? Man, I was thinking, I was like, fuck, I've never done a, a full C1 weekend. So stack the cards in my favor for tomorrow and we'll see what happens. So we heard about, you know, uh, Kerry kind of, being surprised about Strohmeyer blowing up in the in the in the woods and but yeah I, I kind of <laughs> I think we both at the time enjoy the quote about him saying it can't be this easy uh but you know at that point it 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 was and uh him taking that that win but uh should we hear uh from Strohmeyer just to see why the wheels may have come off all right uh before before we talk about the end, let's talk about the beginning. Uh, what from what Kerry said, you went you went down somewhere there early. Uh, no, I didn't. Oh. Well, didn't crash. Okay. But, um, it got a bit interesting early on. There was one lap after the off camber. There's a U turn that comes back up the hill, and I think I was I don't know what position I was in, but I was trying to follow the wheel in front of me and just leaned it over a little too much in the corner and slid out and kind of jump off my bike and run to the top. And then the front front tire in that bike was losing air. I uh, hit something really hard on the first lap, so I had to pit. Um, so that kind of gave Carrie a gap, and yeah, I had to chase from there. Was was it? So were you burning matches trying to get back on from there? Uh, I was trying not to burn matches, just trying to keep the pace high and just riding them back slowly. But it this course is so hard that and it's so windy that I ended up having to ride pretty hard to catch him again pretty much the same speed he like yeah harder than he was going so yeah that that took it out of me a little bit you were able to catch him you made the pass had a gap there and then talk us through that last lap yeah i felt good and i never want to leave it to the last lap because 
yeah, who knows what guys have on the last lap. No, even if you're hurting, like, it's just a different animal. So, yeah, with two to go, I knew I'd attack up the hill. And so, yeah, I attacked up the hill like I had done at Rochester and uh, go cross and everything was good. But I just couldn't get the heart rate to come back down. It's hot and, yeah, super hard course. And I just couldn't recover at all. So eventually the legs just, yeah, they stopped working. And I had nothing left when he caught me, which is just how it goes sometimes. Yeah, for sure. But, I mean obvious question from our point of view to ask you know, two races in a row now just sort of a late race in that 60 minutes is it something you need to change or is it just different circumstances uh, well to be honest i've been working through some stuff uh after rochester i got sick and i pretty much didn't ride my bike uh the whole week leading up to charm and yeah recover better now but still working through some some energy things and it's been a long four weeks, a lot of racing, a lot of really high intensity. So, yeah, it's going to be nice to go home and take a little rest. But, yeah, I mean, can't be can't be upset with second still. Like, yeah. I got to try to win, got to try to to make it happen. So one more chance to get a hockey jersey. I know that's the that's the coolest part. <laughs> I really want one of those. So let's see if we can make it happen tomorrow. Yeah. So breaking news, Andrew Strohmeyer got sick. I mean, that's. That's I mean that the fact that you know be not riding your bike for charm, um, and then to sort of come out and have that weekend kind of kind of explain some things I suppose, like I don't I don't know if there was like any worry that like you know can Strohmeyer hold together the full season like you know he's he stumbled two races in a row now like is is sort of his did he peak too early all those sort of questions you're like okay well that's a different wrench now that we know that he got sick yeah and it, it's it's kind of like in those two races it wasn't it really was him just collapsing you know it wasn't the other riders really putting in heroic final laps to 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 beat him taking nothing away from from both bruner and and uh warner's wins both um you know awesome awesome efforts and 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 great wins and you know Kerry actually you know at the end of that race he was still just flying you know he was he looked really really good you know that that was a, a great win for him but i think that at least Strohmeyer was re reluctant to even tell us that, you know, he was to, uh, afterwards because he didn't want, he didn't want to feel like he was making excuses or that he was taking away anything from his competitors, which I don't, you know, and we were kind of like, well, you're not, it's just answering this question that everybody has. I mean, you're such a dominant rider and then all of a sudden you just completely collapse. What's going on there? You know, what, what changed? And being sick is it kind of explains it. So, you know, we'll just have to see what, what happens going forward, you know, we'll, we'll get to it. He bounced back on Sunday and, um, yeah, now is not racing at, uh, major Taylor, not really sure about, about Cincy, but he'll have some, some time to recover and probably come back as strong as we saw him in the, in the beginning of the season. So Bunston third, he, was he with, I've, I'm now blanking. He had fallen off, he'd fallen off that, that front group, but I mean, you know, Mr. Consistent, I mean, he's he's the guy, like, he's he both days pushes it at the front from the beginning, is going hard. Um, you know, as he said in interviews, you know, maybe this is early, it's, or it's still early for him. This is early season racing, a month in, five week, race weekends, still early. He's got some stuff. He's got uh, bigger coals down the road. I uh, just want to give a shout out again to Ben Frederick, who got fourth uh, in the C1. Really like the stuff best, that I actually, best career, best career result, which is, was awesome, you know? And like he, it was the stuff that I I do really enjoy was post race comes across the line. Funston's like, they ready to give him a hug. You know, there, we see a little emotion. I mean, that, that stuff is also stuff we like to, to show and tell maybe we don't have room for all that, but like, it was good to see that a lot of folks were cheering for Ben. He is, you know, he's, he's been around for a bit. He's, he's one of the, he is the oldest. I'm looking at the results. The oldest guy out there. Uh, Brian, Brian Matter still <laughs> didn't. Well, still... he didn't didn't race, right? Did he? No. Uh, there's one guy older than. Yeah. Than... No, Brian Matter got 20 second. Oh, I'm sorry, Brian. I apologize. Um. Anyway, all that to say, it was it was good to see Ben have that ride. Rode really strong. Was with the, that big group. Was kind of catching 
and riding through people, which if you're a rider, you feel good about. If you're watching, you know that person's on a good day. The big, big, big implications of Kerry Warner winning this race and Funston coming in third is that Warner moved ahead of Funston in the overall series standing. So, you know, that was a, a 12 point swing in, in that result, which meant that now Kerry had 234 points going into Sunday and Funston had 232 points. So Funston had been in second place the whole series, dropped down to third place and it really was going to, I mean, they both want to win the race on Sunday, but I think their eyes are even more focused on each other for Sunday's race. Once again, those narratives playing into the racing tactics. Yeah. And, uh, you know, that's, and again, you know, carries, carries the guy. He's like, I know what's going on. Like, I know when we get into this race, that Strohmeyer who, you know, he's like, I'm sure he wants to win the race, but at the same time, he's, he can just look at us and go, well, you all have a lot more at stake here than I do. So you guys need to figure out what you're going to want to do. And, and again, I don't know if those other guys are thinking that, but Kerry's like already got this thing, you know, he's already gaming the whole thing out before, before the race even starts, which is uh pretty awesome, uh, going in, going into this one. And then, um, yeah, what 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 did we have different on Sunday that we didn't on Saturday? Well, what do we have different? We had a we had a new line on the off camber, right? I'm hoping that's what yeah. you were I'm hoping that's what you were throwing to me for. Um so we had like one line and Scott Page, the director of the series, the director of Rochester Cross, and his crew, I don't didn't get the other gentleman's name, but they were they were out there on Sunday. Digging in, digging in new lines. They sort of wanted to open up uh, that 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 off camber, and it, it did actually. That like there were multiple lines. You had people going from like high to low. You had people right in the middle. It was it was it was cool to see the sort of that change, that feature, and how that I don't know how that played out. At least for like the first few laps, you know, a lot of people in there. Yeah, and uh, well, the one thing about those first couple laps, and maybe the double lines contributed to this, but we had a big group, you know, we had a group again of, of like 10 riders together. And I think that everybody was, you know, I mean, Andrew will talk, you know, we'll hear from him was talking about this in his interview, just that everybody was tired. Everybody was pretty smoked and that nobody really wanted to get to the front and do a ton of work. And that just gave the opportunity for a lot of different riders to, to make their way back up to the, um, up to the front. Uh, but um, it was really, I think, Scott Funston that was like, well, I have to do something here. You know, th that was, you know, he, he was talking about like wanting to win the, the, the race on, on day one. And that just didn't, didn't work out for him. But, you know, this is, this is kind of it for him. You know, he wants to win, but at the same time, he's got to be carry. And, and when he was able to, to get out there, and I think that Warner, I'm not sure what happened with Warner, but he like dropped a chain. He okay. like, he said he, yeah. So basically what happens, Warner kind of had all kinds of issues. Yeah. Scott noticed that and was at the front just like, let's open up this pit and like, let's just like, let's get rid of Warner. I think when we interviewed Kerry, he, you know, it was like a jam chain. He had a, he had a flat when he hit a rock on the run up and just sort of like a lot of issues in the beginning of the race that sort of Scott was trying to pounce on. Yeah. And so that, that came. So then, uh, Strohmeyer you know, looking like his old form was able to get out front. Funston was able to join him. Um, Tyler Clark there as well. Tyler Clark was up there. Jumping but, uh, in the mix. Funston, Funston and uh, Strohmeyer looked like they're working together. Um, Strohmeyer said he was doing some work for Funston. Funston wasn't sure that uh, Strohmeyer was doing any work for him, which was interesting, uh, just how people are looking at the same things differently. Uh, you know, and, and they were able to really put the screws to, to Werner, uh, who had to, you know, do a lot of work just to, just to catch up with even Funston that uh, eventually he was able to do. And eventually, you know, it just uh, played out 
like we'd seen in the past, Stromeyer was able to, you know, make his attack. He waited later until the final lap. Uh, Funston was kind of holding on for dear life, and Kerry was able to to catch him in the end. But uh, this one was exciting. Yeah, I mean, this is I, I remembered this now when I was sort of putting the footage up that night, where I think Str- there was a the point at the pit pit one to fly over day two. I was like, okay, it's going to happen soon. It's going to happen soon. A two to go stroke puts an effort. I mess up my camera. Don't I miss it all. Thankfully, next lap does it again. He goes from pit two, goes to the flyover, opens up a gap immediately. Uh, Funston and Werner are just like on their knees, like chasing so hard. And I was, I was right there because you could, I, I was where I was filming and I was like, kind of gave me chills because like ah this is like this is the cool part about craw this is the cool part about bike racing in general that i love so much when you just when you see people just giving it their absolute effort and it's like that thing you do when you're on the group ride with your buddies and you got a town line sprint and you're just like you just have to beat your best buddy to the sign you just like you want anything you want this more than anything else in the world and to see like to see the looks on on carrie and funds his face that they do not want Stroh to get away from him, and they are trying so hard. They actually, they actually connect back with them, which is, which was really interesting. Is that he put in the effort, and they were actually to get back to him at least for a little bit at the run up. I think. Who should we listen to first? I, I don't know. Third place. Yeah, let's listen to Kerry. How were the legs? How was how was the effort? It looked like it took a while to get going. No, I mean legs were good. I just had some bad luck at the beginning. Uh, I had a. I compressed pretty hard into a rock coming up the run up and I think I got a front flat. So I came in and grabbed a bike. And then I think the next lap I dropped my chain on a higher speed section and jammed it. So I had to like get off and fix it again. And then, and then I dropped my chain again right before pit one and came into the pit again. So it's just like, man, it was just like one fucking thing. The universe was like, Carrie, if you want to sweep this weekend, you're going to have to really work for it. I mean, that was still in play, but also secondary, you had uh, Scott Funston. You all were in this really close battle for second place in the series. Yeah. That come into play as well? Oh, absolutely. I mean, I knew Funston, he was fucking up there just on the gas, like from the gun. As soon as I had my first setback, like I could see him look back and just like drop watt bombs. And then I knew Strohmeyer was just sitting on playing the game. So it's like... Yeah, it was just like, well, I'd bring it down to within five seconds and then have another situation and then bring it down again. It was just like one thing after another. And finally, I caught up with like maybe four laps to go and tried to sit on for a lap, tried to go again. And like, yeah, I don't know. I knew I knew it was going to come down to the end. And uh, it did like on one lap to go. Strohmeyer attacked really hard out of pit one. And I could see Scott coming unglued a little bit. And uh, I just sat on his wheel, um, came back together up the run-up, and then uh, Scott's head gasket blew coming up out of the woods, and he sounded like sounded like breathing was tough. <laughs> and like I knew, I was like, shit, this is it. Like I knew he was gonna like drop anchor, so I came around him. But like, yeah, by that point, Strohmeyer had like five to five to ten bike lengths, and it was like it was just like I didn't quite have the legs to close it down after everything in the beginning of the race. So yeah, bummer. I wanted to give it to him, but I just couldn't. Yeah. But still second place in the series overall and your, you know, full, full attention on cyclocross. So, so pretty cool there and um, sets you up for the rest of the season. No. Yeah. You know, like I'm stoked on like first four races of the USCX series is super cool. Uh, yeah. Just like good battles and like, yeah, and then it, and I'm not going to race for all of October. I've got some work stuff and taking some work weekends off. So, like, then I'm going to do Iceman. So, I probably won't race until Georgia. So, it was a good way to, like, kick the cross season off and then reset and come back at it. So, yeah. Awesome. Well, we, we look forward to seeing it at Nationals as well. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. All right. Great. Uh, yeah. Well, so I heard that Elite is Saturday and Single Speed Sunday. So all the pros better show up for fucking single speed because that would be tight. So a lot of action for for Kerry Warner on day two. Um, yeah, not just not good action. A lot of exactly. uh, a lot of mechanicals and just having to play catch up all day long and still able to 
pull out that uh, t- second second place. You know, uh, you, you talked about Strohmeyer's last lap attack. You know, that there was that was kind of the thing with uh, Strohmeyer before, where he was like, I don't want to leave it to the last lap. But yeah, I, I think after you know feeling not a hundred percent, he was like, well, I don't want to do it at two laps and then blow up with one lap to go. So that's that's kind of where where he was at uh, with that strategy. Be strategy. Let's uh let's chat with Strohmeyer for this final race. All right, uh, sixty minutes of racing today. Yeah, yeah, full full sixty. Well, actually, I don't know how long we raced. I think one less lap than yesterday, which was good. Okay, that that <laughs> play that plays into this. Uh, but it looked like, I mean, it looked like you and Funston there for a while, and then Kerry caught back up. Anything significant out there, race wise? Yeah, it was interesting today. It was super tactical because of the wind. Every, I think everyone's pretty smoked from yesterday. It was just hard race, and then. There, yeah, today with the wind, it kept everything together, and we had, I don't know, a second and third lap group of 10 guys or more uh, that would come back to the front, everyone trying to make their moves to the front. So, yeah, dealing with that a little bit, you go from first to 10th and then back to the front, and eventually Scott or Kerry was a little ways back or made a mistake, and Scott attacked because they were, they were two points from each other, so whoever won would get second in the series, so that played a big role in the race too because they were kind of marking each other really hard, and I just kind of sat there and let them do that. Um, so, yeah, I just followed Scott for, for a while, tried to give him a pull here and there, and just to, to just see what would happen. But Kerry was – he's really strong this weekend, so, yeah, he came back, and then it got tactical. Yeah, what was the move that finally got you away? Yeah, I wanted to wait till the last lap today because – Ideally, I don't leave it to the last lap. I don't like doing that. But with the, with the way I've been feeling, I decided that was probably the best thing to do. And, yeah, I made a move up the hill, but it was a headwind in the gap. I couldn't get that big of a gap. And I tried to ride the, the run-up. I was able to do it in pre-ride today. Uh, so I thought if I could do that, that would solidify it. But even if I can't, they were right there. And then they just come back to the wheel. And, yeah, it's all, all together. So, yeah. Tried that. They came back. Scott made a move for the front. I passed him back and just sent it down the off camber. Uh, I got two two bike legs at the bottom of that, and yeah, that was enough that the next two hills I was able to open up the gap and just enough to carry. Any rebuttal to Funston saying that you were crashing trying to uh, ride the run up? Well, I never crashed. <laughs> um I did. It did take me a little bit to get off my bike on the last lap. Uh, so I'm sure from his perspective, it was pretty pretty great seeing Carrie running, me on the ground. I like that. I like that story more. <laughs> so that's good. But, uh, any thoughts just on the 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 series and uh, how it played out? You know, the four weeks in a row and just the experience. Yeah, it was a really good series. It for sure is hard. Four weeks in a row with double weekends every yeah, just back to back like this is it's tough like i'm ready to go home and take take some time and recover and rest for the for the next part of the season but it's it's made some good racing and it, it's nice that all of it's connected week after week um but yeah it's it's definitely tough having four weekends in a row of just two races yeah. so one of the things that uh Stromer was talking about was riding the run up which is something that i think the viral clip is of tebow doing this at the world cup last year little farther behind Strohmeyer was also riding it so he has that experience last year so he has that experience of of being able to do it when all the riders showed up this year they were like this is really chewed up you know this this thing this year is really not rideable evidently on Sunday before the race Strohmeyer went out there and was able to do it a few times and figured what the heck um last day may as well just go for it and uh was trying just trying to do this in the race and i guess uh never really did it successfully but maybe didn't blub it as bad and <laughs> as his competitor saw it yeah i mean yeah, i mean it kind of seems like uh funston maybe uh you know sees things a little bit differently uh what stromar can pull off and what he can do so i guess he has his own opinions yeah, uh, he certainly does. So uh, Funston ended up um, uh, finishing third on the day, and um, had some words to say about it. Should we? Uh, should we check in with Scotty? 
Let's check in with Happy Fun Ball. Scott, it's the end of the Trek USCX. Um, tell me how today's race went. I mean, you went out hard from the gun. Give me why, why'd you do that and how'd that work out? Carrie was just kind of hanging out back there. I thought he was just out of position, but I, I guess he had all kinds of issues. He like flatted, dropped and chained twice, maybe. Um, so yeah, I don't know. Carrie was back there, and I was like, I want to be in the bike race, but I really just want to beat Carrie. So I'm gonna make him work a little, and he was he was damn strong, so he just kept coming back. So strode. Took like a turn, you know. Would have been nice if you did a little more work, but you know, I, I understand. He's been beaten twice in a row, so you know he's he's got to play his cards right, you know. Were you worried about with those efforts you did earlier that when Carrie came back, if he did, you might kind of suffer a bit? I wouldn't say I was worried. I felt like I was like, I wasn't all in. I was going hard. I was like picking my spots where to go hard, but I wasn't like just completely cross-eyed where i kind of figured carrie was unless he was playing some master plan he was all in to come back you know and so i felt like maybe i'd be have a little more left in the tank than him uh last lap you guys are all together uh strohmeyer punches it here out of pit one i mean what happened after that i mean i think it kind of started before then like Strohmeyer went pretty hard out of the barriers um, and over to Factory Hill. Had a tiny gap out of Factory. It was so slippery up flat Factory Hill. Like you, you want to just stand up and go, but like the rear wheel would just slip then. Uh, so like I kind of had to stitch it back together on the start finish straight, and then he kept it going up the hill. And I thought almost I'd get by. I like kind of pulled alongside of him, but I didn't quite have it. Um, and then he tried to ride the hill. I don't know. I guess Strohmeyer's just, just messing around, having a good... That was like... He tried it like three times. Um, apparently, he did it in practice. I, I want to see the footage. But... I thought I thought it was off... Yeah, I thought it was off the agenda this year. So, yeah. like, you telling me he tried to ride the hill? Yeah, like literally three times. He Multiple times. And that time, yeah, he he made it to, like to the route and then had to like, and, like tipped over to the drive side and had to get off drive side. So I ran, I almost passed him there, but then I think he was like a little, I don't know, maybe, I don't know what, but so then like a couple current turns after he kind of was like sitting up and I was like, well, I'm just going to pedal right here and get in the lead. But then he passed me right back at the stairs. Um, and then I was pretty cooked from then. We hit those hills on the backside and he got a couple bike lengths, Carrie got by me and I was just, I don't know, I didn't have, have much left after that and. So yeah, I don't know. I got they were both better than me this weekend. Um, I don't know. It's early season cross. It's never really been my thing. So I'll take it. <laughs> yeah, we just reflect on uh, you know eight races. You finished third overall in the series. I mean, how are you feeling about that? I'll take it. You know, um, would have been nice to get a win somewhere. Eight race days, six times on the podium. No, every C1 I was on the podium, and I think the last two C2s, so I think that makes six out of eight on the podium. Um, yeah, it would have been cool to get a win, but I don't know. His consistency is, is great, and three weekends off at home before Pan Ams. Pan Ams and Nationals are, and Europe is what, what matters. This is fun and cool and stuff, but... I don't know. Um, if Strohmeyer doesn't win either jerseys, that will we really remember at the end of the year? You know, his his dominance. It'll be maybe just a footnote. So it's a lot of a lot of big racing to come. A footnote. Footnote. Well, you know, I, I appreciate Funston. Um... I appreciate all of the interviews that we had. I, I mean, this is just like it, it is refreshing to be in a sport that everybody feels comfortable enough to yeah. just speak candidly i i think that yeah i don't know i i uh, funson always has hot takes i'm 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 here for it i don't he does I don't think... and you know like you know you can't i mean 
Strohmeyer won six out of eight races. I mean, you got to knock the guy down a little bit. You know, you can't let his head get too big. You got, you know, you got to like, he, he's taking away the jersey. He's taking away the, the, the trophy. Like, Clemson's going to kick your knees a little bit. So, yeah. yeah. I mean, little, little bit of bulletin board material. Exactly. Exactly. You better watch out, I guess. Interesting stuff. This is good. So, it's going to make uh, Pan Ams and um, uh, Nationals that much. That much better, but uh, I mean, a great series. It, it was really a mm-hmm. lot of fun to be there and to to watch it. And it was it was fun to to see the level of competition. I think that um, I think we what we saw it was kind of a reverse of last year where we saw some great competition on the women's side, but it was dominated by two European racers. So I think that we are still looking to see how the women's domestic group is going to is going to pan out and i think we'll see that over the next couple of weeks i think since is going to be a really good test to see who's on top without you know the the without clausel and without bacher kind of dictating the race it's going to be interesting to see how that plays out you know also at major taylor on the men's side i think we're already we're already in that you know we already it's just it was just north americans out there um going at it so we got a pretty good look at at where we stand just domestically on, on the men's side. So that'll be fun to see how that plays out for the rest of the season as well. Yeah, no, I agree. I think, I think that is another story to look forward to. And yeah, the men's racing has been exciting to kind of, and this is, you know, I'm going to go back to what I said in episode one of this season, the newbies versus the veterans. Okay, how about that? We'll go with that phrase. Like, who who is going to come forward and sort of like say no? Like, I'm going to be a main character. And now, what I th- I think what is is great is that we've had we had we had Strohmeyer really step up this season. But also, is he like, a newbie or a veteran then? Well, he's a newbie. I consider him a newbie. Huh? I mean, I know he's been around. I know okay. he's won national champions before. But I'm I'm sort of talking about you know. I, I mean, this is his first year as an elite. Right. So let's go with that. So, and, yeah. you know, but like we had Bruner won a race, Warner won a race, um, you know, guys that, you know, Werner was, uh, Werner was at my first Nationals Boulder 2014, right? So he's got some experience, you know, listening to his interviews, Werner knows he's a gamer. He knows what's going on. So, yeah, I've, I've, li- I've liked that this has sort of happened. We have some new characters and, you know, Tobin has came back, came back to cross. I would consider Tobin a veteran. He most definitely is a veteran. And like, like he was, he was thrown down. Right. And he was, he was giving us like very deep reads into race strategy. And like, ah, Scott was, you know, doing all this work for, for Strohmeyer. He shouldn't have been doing that. You know? So we, we had a little bit of a clash of, of, you know, I'm not going to say generations, but generations. And it was good. It was great. Fantastic. Yep, I think so. It may be until Pan Ams or Nationals until we see them all back together again, just how the the rest of this plays out. But no, looking forward to it. Looking forward to see what happens at uh, Major Taylor this weekend. I think I'm going to do a post um, coming up just about the new Nationals schedule that's come out. uh, Consolidated Nationals this year. Uh, Really looking forward to having all the elite races on Saturday. Pretty stoked. I mean, we heard um carrie mentioned that where he wants everybody to show up for the single speed race on sunday uh so it's gonna be interesting to see how that plays out we'll talk about that more also have the new um cyclocross uh rankings that came out on tuesday so i'll get those up as well um yeah but i think i think i think that does it you know next week uh we'll have major taylor but you know maybe we'll be able to throw in some um, other topics in there as well. Yeah, I just want to say, you know, before we get out of here, is that I got to meet some of the Bolton subscribers, members at, at Trek. I got to meet a Kodiak Rider case. Got to meet Mags and her husband and their child. And just a lot of folks, a lot of... We, we had a first time... I met somebody who had just watched the YouTube video of this podcast and was not aware that we have been doing a regular podcast for five years. And I was like, well, that's great. Like, that's cool. Like, we did this and it clicked into a new audience. So welcome. 
Uh, if you don't have time to you know, watch the YouTube video, we do have the audio feed. I uh, ran into a few people who weren't aware of the Instagram, so put them that way. Anyway, just it's good again to see more folks, meet people who we've chatted with online. Uh, thanks for all the shouts of encouragement. Uh, I definitely needed it. My legs are still tired, um, even though I just flew in. Um, but yeah, it was just just want to put a bow on that and say great to see folks and appreciate all the love and support. And uh, it's, as I said before, it's, it it makes it worth it when people will say thank you. And uh, in- when you when you fly in, if we learn anything from the borscht belt, that's when your arms are tired. Yeah, you know, sometimes I'm trying to get these jokes in there and, you know, maybe it's a Fred Flintstone plane, you know. The, we'll see you all the next time. Pterodactyl's using the wings and I'm using my feet. Is it over? It's over. <laughs> okay, great. <laughs>